So we're back for another live event and as usual we'll be talking about the technology that really makes a difference to people with sight loss. And this week we're going to take a look at an app that we've mentioned a couple of times already on our live events and that is Seeing AI. Now this is a really useful app and it, it can be a really versatile app as well. And today Daniel Dunn is going to be talking us through just what it can do, what its features are and how you can use it. And then a little bit later on in the show, we're going to be turning our attention to laptops. What, what you need to do if you're thinking of buying a laptop. So how do you decipher the list of specifications when you go into a store? to buy one. Well, we're going to have an opportunity to discuss that with our panel today as well. Speaking of which, who's on the panel today? Well, this week we'll have Daniel back with us and we'll have Sean Doran as well, both regulars on the show and both with a lot of experience when it comes to laptop configurations, etc. So they'll be joining in that discussion a little bit later on. Now, just a, a reminder that if you have any comments or questions, please do send them in and we'll do our best to include them in the show. And if not, then we'll make sure that somebody gets back to you with an answer. So to ask a question, you can email us at labs at ncbi.ie or you can use the question panel to the right of your screen. So please do uh, send us through uh, any questions that you have and we'd be, we'd be happy to address those in the show if we possibly can. If you'd like to support our services so that we can continue to provide services to those who are blind or vision impaired, you can also visit donate.ncbi.ie. That's donate.ncbi.ie. Or a new opportunity as well, if you'd like to sponsor one of our live events, well, you can do that as well by contacting labs at ncbi.ie and that can help to keep our live events going as well. So let's start off with our first subject for today, and, and that is the Seeing AI app. Now you've probably heard of this app already. It's uh, one that's been actually mentioned a few oh, times on our show oh, so far. Thank you. In fact, I think it was um, mentioned just in the interview last week that we covered as being one of the, the apps that's really useful to have. Well, we're going to look at this in two parts. And Daniel Dunn has prepared this overview for us. Now, just to mention that this overview is done without voiceover switched on, partly just due to time constraints. But if you do need support to install this app with, with voiceover, the labs team is always help, happy to help. So please do get in touch if you want to do that. So let's listen now to Daniel as he takes us through the first part of our Seeing AI overview. Hello everybody and thank you for joining us here today where we are going to take a look at the Seeing AI app that's available on the iPhone and the iPad and um, we'll go through the features of the app showing you what it can do and how to install it. So first up I have connected a mouse to my iPad today for the purposes of this demonstration and the mouse is that circle there, yellow circle with a grave infill and that will simulate what you would touch on your iPad screen in order to get in and out of apps and be able to carry out the functions associated with the apps that we're looking at. So I'll start off first of all by going to the App Store, the Apple App Store, where we will install Seeing AI. And that uh, Apple App Store app is the blue one with a white A in the center. And if it's not on your first home screen, just simply slide across and have a look out for it along the way. It could be anywhere in your list of apps, depending on how much you have installed. So we'll tap first of all on the App Store. And normally when you land in here, you arrive on the today screen, which will give you the day's date and it'll give you what's popular in the App Store and stuff that Apple has uh, decided that is a popular uh, what's the 
the most popular apps out there. Then you have the games apps, other apps as well, the arcade section. And finally, we're looking for the section. So all those, uh, the search section. So all those are across the bottom of your screen. So the bottom right into search. So I'm just tap there. And underneath the title for search, we have got the gray search bar. So we tap in there. And that will enable your keyboard, uh, on screen keyboard if you don't have an external one connected by Bluetooth. And we're going to type in seeing AI. So S E E I N G, then a space A I. Um, hit the blue enter button to commence our search. And we get a list of results here. So the app we're looking for is the Seeing AI. It's this green colored icon with S through the shape of an eye is the icon. And normally you would have a get button here, but I had previously installed this app before and uninstalled it just to show everybody how to uh, download that and install it today. So we have a little cloud with an arrow there that indicates the app was installed on your device before and just tap that to reinstall it. If you haven't, you will have a get button and either icon will enable you to reinstall that app. So it downloads and depending on the speed of your internet, it may take a minute or two or perhaps three minutes to download and install. So we'll just go in here while it's installing and we'll explore um, We'll explore a little bit more about it. It's from the Microsoft Corporation and they have only made it available for iPhone and iPad. Uh, it's out about two years now and Microsoft has said they will eventually release it for Android users, but we haven't heard any update on that recently. So we can only presume they're still working on it. In here is the version history. So we can tap in here. Um, every so often they'll uh, send out updates for the apps. Um, so as you can see there, it's sorted by the most recent updates three months ago, six months ago. And occasionally they add new features. So this particular one, three, version 3.3, they've added in support languages for Dutch, French, German, Japanese and Spanish, and you can read more about that by tapping on that more link there. And as you can see, going the whole way back through the list of updates, you can see all the features they have been adding all the way along since they released the app about two years ago. So we'll come back out of that. And um, we'll, while it's still installed, we'll just get a little bit of a uh, preview of what's contained. So the app takes advantage of the camera that's in built into your iPad or iPhone and its main feature is to take a photograph of documents and pick up on the text and that brings it back to a scan results screen from where you can increase the text size or read back the text that is detected. There's also a uh, recognize uh, faces function on it in the people section. We won't actually be doing that in our demonstration today um, because of the COVID-19 situation. We are social distancing, so we don't have any colleagues that we can use to participate in that demonstration. But do download and install the app yourself at home and try it with your family members. So I'll show you in later in the demonstration how to access that. Another feature of the app is for identifying products. So it'll look for a barcode that's on a product, take that photograph of the product and give you information about that. It works on most products. I won't say every product is covered, but um, most products do definitely come back with a result. Uh, short text is the main feature of the app and instantly reads whatever text is in view of the camera. So I'll be showing you that as well. So I'll just come back out of those. There are more features. We'll go through them now in a few moments. <clears throat> so first of all, we've got our open 
button here, which indicates that the app has been installed. But I'm just going to show you by returning to the desktop um, where I just tap the home button here, where the where the app is and the icon that you're looking out for. So I just scroll across here, there's many apps on this iPad and it has popped it in here. So there is the icon for seeing AI and I tap on that. And because we have just installed it, it's looking for permission to use the camera. Sorry, now everything is on its side at the minute. It's just part of the setup. As soon as we get into the app, it reorientates the correct way around. So you might have to turn your head sideways to read this. It's saying, seeing AI would like to access the camera and you give it permission by saying OK to that. That's important to tick that OK, because if you don't give the app permission, to access the camera, it really takes away from all the functionality of the app. So an introduction screen then comes up and we're just going to skip that. And then the regular terms and conditions of use. So tap the little box here to accept those and we go for get started. And we tap on that. Short text. Now, Thankfully, my screen has rotated back the correct way around, so we're making sense again. Now, short text is the starting point of seeing AI, and because the app is new, it'll give us this once off uh, advice script, and it tells us to hold the camera over some text to have it automatically read to you. As new text comes into view, it'll also be read aloud, out aloud. While reading out aloud, seeing AI may start again from the beginning if the camera captures a clear image of the text. So what that means is try and hold your iPad or your iPhone as steady as possible over the page of text that you have on a flat surface. And if you hold it quite steady, it will not jump back to the start and read again. So uh, that is a good bit of advice to take on board. And if you find that your hand is not steady enough to control the camera and it's starting back over and over again, there is another option to go in to have it read a document. Also, there are video tutorials that you're advised to go and look at online. Microsoft have put, put up uh, tutorials on YouTube that you can click in and watch. So I'm just going to exit this little advice uh, script here. There's a narrow to the left up in the top left of your screen. We'll tap on that. Children and young people on a Tamil's Snap UCR services and or took part in activities in 2019. There is a demand to continue to support the development of independent living and travel skills, assistive technology and peer support. In addition, parents requested more resources to develop. Okay, <clears throat> so I had already set up a page from our NCBI uh, catalog at the back of the camera, and it has started to read from that page, reading the words that started at the top and continued along. And I've paused it so it doesn't continue talking over what I'm trying to say here. And to continue, then you can just tap the play button. And it will read again for you. So I might just move the camera a little bit. You also have the options to change the language. So it's default set to English. And you can change if it's if you know the language of the text is different, you can pick that from the list and it will read that out correctly in its native language. So the next one we have is the channels across the bottom here. So we have document, product, person, currency, uh, scene, color, handwriting and light. And we're going to explore most of these uh, just to highlight there that there's three of them have a yellow test tube symbol on them, which means that that section of the app has not been completed and the results may not be as accurate as one would hope, but they are constantly working and updating on this app. So do check for the updates and install those as they come down and each of these sections will eventually be completed. So the next one we're going to go for is document. Document. 
So <clears throat> it tells us to hold the camera over a printed page to capture it. Good advice is to have the page left down on a flat surface and um, to go in then to document and it will guide you to move a little to the left or to the top or to the bottom in order to get the whole edges of the document visible. And when it's happy with that, it'll take the photograph, it'll advise you that it's going to take the photograph by saying, please hold steady. The reason it wants you to, do, to hold steady is so that the text does not become blurred from the photograph and that the uh, optical character recognition will work correctly and give you good results. So it's advice then is a good technique is to place the camera in the center of the page, move it away slowly, making slight adjustments. And another piece of advice is try and have the page, usually everybody works with a white A4 sheet. So if you had it on a dark background, dark uh, table top or countertop, uh, it will make it a lot easier for the app to recognize the edges of your document. And once the results come back, then you can play the results to hear that text read aloud and you can increase or decrease the size of the text on the results screen and you can also share it out. Again, there's a little video tutorial that you can click on to go onto YouTube and that will show you that in action as well. So I'm just going to pop back out here, top left arrow back out, tap here. Um, we're going to look. No edges visible. So at the moment it's telling me no edges visible. No edges visible. So I'm just going to grab no edges visible. And come back out. And I'll just keep a hold look. steady. Processing. Okay. So yeah. So I just move a little to the left to exclude the page to the right hand side. So and then you heard it say hold steady and it took its snapshot. So this requires an internet connection in order for the text recognition to work. And depending on the lighting and how steady you hold your hand and, and make sure that the lens of the camera is clean, uh, all those factors come into play in determining that you get good results. And just from casting my eye over this scan result, I can see that the detection has been quite accurate. Uh, overall, I find 99% of the text is correctly picked up and not time it will get maybe a word wrong or something like that. And um, that can be down to maybe poor quality print. So often we find that uh, a photocopy of something might not come out as clear and uh, then that, that hinders the accuracy of the results. So if you have a good clear print out on the page that you're trying to capture, the results will reflect that. So I'm going to show you now on the results page what you can do with this. And we have down in the bottom left our play button and that can be used to read back the text. So I'll just show you that. We'll tap on the play button. Body, font family, Arial, font size. 12 points. Welcome to NCBL's Children and Young Persons, SIP, Services Calendar of Events for 2020. We are delighted to be able to continue to increase our offer of workshops and events delivered by our highly trained staff in the Children and Young Persons team. Okay, so I've paused that there. So you can see on the readback that it is able to read back the text quite accurately and highlight the sentences on and highlight the word it is reading. Now, as mentioned earlier, you can increase the size of the text. So over here to the bottom right, we've got the A plus and the A minus symbols. So if we tap on A plus, I'm just going to stop the text actually to remove our highlighting there while we're increasing. So I have it up to the top there. And you can simply just scroll down through the document. And you've got quite large text there, which should make it easy to read back. If that's too big, you have the A with the minus, which is the center one of the tree in the bottom right. And we tap on that. And again, the text returns back 
that's smaller. And that's in our document there. Also, we have the share button in the very bottom right. Uh, it's a little box with an arrow emerging from it. And it gives us two options. We can share the image or share the text. So we're going to just tap on share text. And you can save it to your files or copy the text that's there or email it to somebody. So I'm just going to show you the way that would work in email. It instantly launches up a new email where you can type in who it is you want to send it to. Oops, tapped in to a, so if I want to send it to myself, tap that there and send it on. And that is gone to my email inbox as an attachment, which I can open and get that text. Andy, if you want to send something back maybe to a laptop and you want to be able to open the attachment and copy and paste that text maybe in somewhere else into likes of Word or something on your PC. Very handy for that. Very good. So that gets us off to a really good start there uh, with seeing AI. Thanks very much, Daniel, for taking us through that. And Daniel's actually joining us now to talk a little bit about seeing AI. Now, there was a few things actually that, that kind of caught the attention there as we were looking at the uh, video. So you mentioned that it was um, on Apple, Daniel. Uh, can, yeah. can you actually get that for Android? Or is there any kind of news with regards to when that would be available on Android? Yeah, no, uh, Jude, I did I did um, record that quite a few weeks back, and unfortunately, things have not changed since I recorded that. Um, there is no there's no launch date for Android given from Microsoft at the moment, so we are, uh, you know, we're, we're left with nothing new in that regard, and we just have no idea when, when when they're coming along with it. They have promised, I think, it's about over a year ago now that they are working on an Android version. We still haven't heard a thing though. OK, so that hasn't come through. So if somebody wanted some of these same sort of features, is there any kind of alternatives that they could go for on Android? There is. There's an app on Android called Envision AI, and it is quite similar in fairness to seeing AI. Uh, now, the bad news for Android users is that you'll only get a short trial of that and then you've got to uh, you've got to purchase the app. So um, whereas on the iPad uh, and the iPhone, the seeing AI is completely free at the moment. So that is a little bit of a bummer for the Android users. Yeah, OK, that's actually good to mention as well, because that was one of the questions that came came in there. Was there a cost attached to, to this app? But this one is yeah. free. Yeah, the seeing AI is free at the moment. Um, like Microsoft, in fairness, now to have quite a bit of work into this, it's, it's ongoing over two years at this stage. And I would not be surprised to see it become um, a pay for app at some stage in the future. Yeah. OK, very good. Um, so it's it's kind of useful for us to to know anyway, at least at the moment that it's a it's a free app and there are alternatives, at least for for Android users. Now, yeah. we mentioned before the video that for a, for a number of reasons, we don't have um, we didn't have voiceover on on that particular video, but will it work on voiceover? Would would you be able yes. to have voiceover? Yes, yes, uh, it will work with uh, voiceover. Uh, in fairness, it is very, very usable. Um, with, with with voiceover, I've uh, tried it out many times, and yeah, it's it's a very smooth experience. Uh, the trickiest one, I suppose, for somebody who's a voiceover user to master, I suppose, would be the document and just to maintain the balance of the you know the device's camera above the page, you know, mm -hmm. correct height, just just to grab the the, the, the camera is looking for the edges of those pages, uh, just for for it to focus on that to try and um, to grab a full page. That is the real tricky. Uh, par for somebody to try and master, but other than that, no, it's it's quite good. Yeah, very I, good. I, I find with that bit there, um, if I place the phone or iPad directly in the middle of the page and lift it up slowly, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, give a better indication of what when you're going to find the corners, and seeing it uh, gives you plenty of indication when it can see all four. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Yeah, very good. And what we might do as well is uh, we'll we'll prepare a video with voiceover as well. And obviously, we won't have as much time constraints. We might load that directly onto YouTube so that any who are looking for uh, that same video with uh, with voiceover will have it prepared for YouTube as well, and they'll be able to get it there. Um, one one question that came in, you might not have an answer for this straight off, but just in relation to using Siri um, voice control for for your phone, if you're using using seeing AI and you want to use Siri to kind of change between the different modes in seeing AI between short text yeah. and long text. Can you do that? You can. Yeah, it actually came out in one of the recent updates um, into the settings of seeing AI. You can add in the um, the Siri command. So um, you can go, hey, Siri, recognize text and it'll automatically, there's my phone going doing it in the background. Um, <laughs> it'll go, it'll go straight for seeing AI, open it up to the document section or if you're the headset to identify product, it'll go straight to the product part and switch the camera on so you're just shining at, uh, at the product's barcode and it will come back with um, with a result then so definitely the Siri integration has been a massive massive improvement and well done to Microsoft for that. Brilliant very good and maybe just one last question on this part obviously if anybody has any other questions keep them coming in um, but maybe just is there is there any particular difficulties that people find with seeing AI just in your experience as they're using it? Is there any little tips that can overcome um, particular difficulties people might have in its use? Is there any common kind of pitfalls if you like? Yeah, I, th I think Sean alluded to it perfectly mm. there. Um, you know, pl placing the camera in the center of the page and 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 slowly uh, bringing it back up off off the counter or the table, whichever you have the document on. That's definitely mm. one good one to. I, I suppose I suppose the other one, Daniel, would be um, that seeing I needs internet access to connect to Microsoft's uh, cloud server, while mm. something like KNFB Reader is all done centrally on the phone. Mm. Okay. Okay, that's that's interesting. So you can use that that one KNFB reader without internet. You can use it's much more expensive, but it, it has all the engine and OCR ability built into the app itself. While seeing AI takes a picture, sends it off to Microsoft's cloud server. It's put into their AI, basically their AI engine, which scans the document and sends you back. It's all encrypted and safe and secure. Mm. But um, KNFB reader does all that locally on your device. So that would be like a, a downside to seeing AI where you would need net access. Yeah, excellent. So if somebody's having trouble with it, that might be one of the reasons why. So that's interesting just to get um, those extra details. We're, we're going to move on to the next part now. So if, if uh, anybody does have continuing um, kind of questions, if there's any other questions that you do have, um, please do uh, send them in. You can either email us at labs at ncbi.ie or you can um, you can uh, use the question panel on the right hand side of your screen and uh, we're just going to go into our second part of our video now and we'll get back to any of those questions a little bit later. Next one. No edges visible. Product. Product. So you can see from the bottom there, you can select which part of the app you want to use. And again, hold the camera over a product until you hear beeps that indicate a barcode is in view. Uh, holding the camera further away and slowly going closer works best. The faster the beeps, the closer you are to the barcode. When the barcode is detected, seeing AI will say product name. What the most products out there, and um, obviously they will provide additional information about the product if it's available. You can have more, read more about it. Again, in the video tutorial, which will take it to YouTube. So I'm just come back out of there, and what I'm going to do next is I have a book, and I'm going to just move it in view of the camera. Processing. So let's read a story. Hide and seek. So quite quickly, you know, within a second of getting the barcode, uh, the barcode here into the view of the camera, it detects it and it gives back the result. It's saying, let's read the story, hide and seek. And we we'll just turn the product around. Uh, yep, yeah, it's a Disney child's book. Let's read the story, the hide and seek excellent results. So 
most products out there, you pop it in front of the camera and tell you what they are. Next one we're going to try out currency. is currency. So currency recognition is always improving. Uh, so still have somebody you trust confirm the note's value. Uh, hold the camera over a single note to hear the estimated value. Use the button on the main screen to select which currency should be recognized. Uh, if your currency is not listed, uh, please inform them and they'll try and get that added for you. But um, we are in the euro area and it has that covered, so we should be good on that front. And just a note of caution, seeing AI cannot differentiate between real and counterfeit money. So just to be aware of that. Again, there's a link to the YouTube video tutorial, which you can follow and try that. So it's a Thursday afternoon. Cost recognition due to inactivity. Okay. So this five euros. Tap that and five we, euros. We have five euros there. Um, unfortunately, it's a Thursday. Wallet is a little bit empty, so we're just down to our last five euro note here today. So the scene again, um, you can try that out. Um, I'm just going to pop, pop a pen here. Oops, I'm trying to get. I'm just going to pop, pop a pen here. Oops, I'm trying to get to stand up. We tried the scene. Scene preview. Uh, it will take a photograph of a scene. It's still experimental, so it might not be as accurate as you hope. Uh, take a photo and hear the description of the scene it captured. It isn't always correct, so to try and help them with that, you can always send in your feedback again. Another link to the tutorial there. I'll come back out. And what I'm looking for here is the camera icon on the left. And then just processing. <laughs> Probably a close up of a white wall. Okay, it missed my pen. But um, yeah, I have a white sheet of paper behind the iPad here, and it's thinking it's a wall. So maybe I just try this pen again. See, can we get can we get anything from that? So processing. It seems to be office supplies, pen, tool, writing implement, weapon, ball pen, okay. office instrument, marking tools, yep. brush, pencil, scissors, stationery. Quite a broad, quite a broad description there, but it did get the ball pen in there, so yeah, we'll give it a thumbs up on that. As, as it says, it is experimental, and um, its explore photo feature has been added as well. So you can move, you can move over the sections of the photo, and it should call out what it is as you move over that. Processing. So just as an additional process. One item detected. Move your pen. Pen. Cool. You got it. Okay. Well done seeing AI. So we'll come back out of that section. And uh, the next is the color. Color preview. Okay. Again, depending on light, uh, the lighting factors, it'll detect color and the shadows and all that, it, it uh, might detect quite a slightly yellowish if we have artificial lighting on. So just to bear that in mind, it will do its best. Again, it's experimental. Um, so we'll try that out now. Gray. Okay, so yeah, a little bit poor lighting here. The sun has gone in, the clouds are over, uh, the gray clouds are over, so that's reflected in our color. Here. Gray and yellow. Orange and yellow. So I just pop into gray and green. 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 Gray. So. Gray and green. Gray and green. Brown. Brown. Brown and greenish brown. Brown and red. Brown and red, yeah. Red and brown. Yeah. So. Gray. Not too bad on that front. It is a little bit dull here today. Um, we did have sunshine up till about 20 minutes ago. Unfortunately, that has gone in, so I think our lighting is not as good. So our next section we'll try is the handwriting. Handwriting preview. Okay, so again, just a word of caution, this is still in development. And um, we 
have to have the text the correct way up and depending on the handwriting style, which can obviously vary greatly from individual to individual, uh, so it'll do its best. Uh, it will be quite interesting to see how the doctor's prescription would work. Anyway, let's give it a twirl. I have prepared this little piece of text. I'm just going to get it into the center of the camera there. And I'm going to snap that. Processing. Hello there. How are you today? Okay, 10 out of 10 seeing AI. So again, you have the option to share that. Um, share that, save it to your files or pop it in an email. Again, that is very handy to have as well. You can save the photo if you want. Uh, I might actually do that. Again, if you want to allow it access to your photo library, we say OK on that. And access your location. OK, we'll save while we're using the app. And it says our photo is saved successfully. So those first two questions that popped up, they won't pop up again because we've, it, um, we've answered those. So pop back out there. The light then, I just remove this. Depending on the light, it will, the higher the pitch, the closer it is to a light source. Light. Be handy for someone, um, you know, did I leave the light on in the room? Just get this section open and shine it upwards and it'll increase the pitch. Most of the channels I've covered there, I know I left out the person uh, because we don't have anybody here at the moment that we can demonstrate that on, but do try that one at home. Next thing I want to bring your attention to is up here in the top left, we've got three lines. We'll tap on that, and that allows us to browse the photos in our gallery. Um, so if you wanted maybe to lift text from a photograph you took earlier, or you wanted to identify if I was in a photograph that we did earlier, uh, that's where you can go from there. So if we go to browse photos, so browse photos stored on your phone or your iPad, and it'll analyze it for objects, people, text, and location. And you can, when using VoiceOver, you can swipe through the thumbnails. You'll initially hear a basic description. If you analyze the photo using Seeing AI, that gets stored with it in your gallery. So if you're going back in two, three weeks time and you're looking for a photograph, you know, maybe you took one of the dog outside and it'll say, you know, dog in the garden and give you those little descriptions. So it's very handy if you did want to send a particular photo to somebody that you knew you were getting the one you wanted. So instead of trying to rely on the date and time it was took, you get the option of hearing a little bit more about it. So probably a close up of text on a white background. Durham, okay. Ireland. Hello there. How are you today? 1222. So you heard it read out all about that little photograph we took and saved a few moments ago of the handwriting text. So it tells you it's text on a white background, correct. And then it picked up the text and read that back to us, correct. And it told us that we took the photograph in Ireland again, correct. So absolutely fantastic stuff. So we'll come back out of that. Uh, we go next to our settings section and you can set your default currency. You can add in series shortcuts and I'll just demonstrate that for you. And what I'm going to do is, first of all, I'm going to do your series shortcuts. I've done some of these here already. Um, so we'll just do recognize color for example. And you, you can 
tap on that, recognize color or any of these commands and add them to Siri. So you can see the ones that have been added are ticked and to activate those, what I'm going to do is ask Siri to recognize handwriting. So I'm just going to summon Siri. Handwriting preview. So it brings us straight to that and we're ready to tap on our camera. Processing. Hello there, how are you today? And let's try, so actually we'll come out of the app. And just close off the app altogether. And we'll try that Siri one more time with, let's say the currency, which I think will be very handy to have. So I'm just going to go for Siri. So straight into the app and it starts reading straight away. So I'm just going to pause that. So that is how the Siri shortcuts can work. It makes it very easy to use from that point of view. You can ask it to recognize the document or recognize a person. You can build all those into uh, Siri. So again, just to highlight that three lines in the top activates your menu into settings and configure Siri shortcuts. Also in the settings, you, you can change that voice. If you don't like the voice you hear, you can change that. Simply going in here and picking one of the other voices. You can select the, the volume and yeah, have, have that in your own in your own particular preference. You can move the slider up and down. And you can also, uh, when you're browsing photos, always show the newest photographs first, which is extremely handy. If you're out and about, you take a photograph and you come home, then you want to analyze that photograph. It's nice that you're not searching everywhere for it. It's one of the first ones in your gallery. So thank you very much for listening in on this webinar. And if you have any questions on the Seeing AI app, uh, don't hesitate to get in contact with your local NCBI IT training and support person. And they will be glad to help any of you guys out getting started on this app and doing any of the training. Uh, I hope you get more familiar with it. So thank you very much and we'll see you again soon. So thanks very much. Daniel for taking us through that overview of seeing AI. Apologies for uh, the sound there. If the sound wasn't too great, again, we'll make sure that that's fixed for our YouTube uh, segment as that's uploaded onto YouTube. Um, quite interesting though, as you're uh, listening to how the seeing AI app actually works, it really is very versatile. Um, we just do have maybe one or two more questions that have come in, uh, Daniel, if you're yep. if you're still with us there. Um, one particularly actually is just in relation to, we saw how it could recognize money. Can it recognize coins? Unfortunately not, uh, Jude. It's uh, paper money only. Um, they, they, have, they haven't uh, got around to doing coin yet. I'm not sure if it's something that they could ever master because it, it, it will be quite tricky. Whereas mm. the notes have, has more defined, um, you know, has a more defined print on your coin, scratches, things like that. And the similarity of the metal the whole way across the coin, I think will be very difficult for it to do. Maybe down the road, but for now, I'm not so sure. Yeah, OK, thank, thanks. Um, it's kind of uh, it's interesting that it can do the notes, at least at least the very valuable stuff. And, we can yeah, get and right. different currencies as well. Yeah, yeah, that's that's very useful. Um, I noticed as well as you were going through, how is the image recognition in general? We saw the example there of the pen and the mm. kind of wide range of different th answers that kind of came back when you when you were trying to recognize the pen. Is it is that a pretty middle of the road example of how accurate it is? It, in fact, actually, I would say that's kind of one of the poor examples. Um, my pen wasn't fantastic. wasn't a fantastic <laughs> pen that I used. One of those cheap ones from a look bag, I guess. Uh, <laughs> it did its best. Um, it did mention pen in it. Um, 
Yeah, you know, I've done a, I've, you know, done a, a scene. Let's say, you know, the kitchen table at home with the laptop on it, and you know, it got that perfect. Uh, you know, a stack of books, it got that perfect. Um, you know, TV on the wall, things like that. It, it, it is, it is quite good um, overall. Um, I suppose there are a couple of things it'll be a little bit trickier. You know, um, but generally quite good experience. Mm -hmm. Very good, and definitely a, a really useful app for people to have if they're if they do have the the Apple or the the uh, yeah the Apple devices as opposed to the Android devices at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, definitely a, a go to app to have on it. So thanks for taking us through that and just a reminder to everyone that if you if you'd like support on using any of the technologies that we cover in our live events please do contact the labs team here at labs at ncbi.ie or by phone on 1850 92 30 60. so now we're going to just move on to our final topic for today and uh, we're going to be talking about laptops in our final topic. Now, if you've reached that point where your old laptop just isn't cutting the mustard anymore and you need to upgrade it, it can be a bit confusing just trying to work out how to go about it. When you go into a store or check online and all you see is a list of specifications that don't even see to be in English. It's kind of hard to know where to start sometimes. So NCBI Labs is here to help you specifically in the form of Daniel Dunn again and uh, Sean Doran is joining us as well for this. So both have great experience with uh, laptop components and building laptops and supporting laptops and all of that background that you'd want from somebody giving you advice. So we're going to get the opportunity to, to chat to Sean and Daniel about this and maybe we could start with just some of the terminology that you do often see on sort of specifications sheets for laptops that are up for sale. For example, you hear about processors, for example. Um, how important is a processor in a laptop? Is that one of the key things to to get right when you're buying a new laptop? Yeah, it's, it's possibly the, the most important thing to get to get right in a laptop. The processor is what's doing all the computation and all the calculations to actually make all your programs work. Mm. Yeah, and thanks. and uh, the higher the, it'll be measured in gigahertz. Mm. Uh, so we'll often see like 1.5, 2, 2.5, 2.6, 2.7. And the higher that number, the, fa the faster your computer will be able to process information. Okay. So if you had a, a 1.5 gigahertz processor, it's going to take you know twice as long, if not maybe four times as long to do something as a 3. Point gigahertz mm. processor. And also the more cores, you'll often hear people saying my, my processor's dual core. Uh, they're mm. also faster the more cores the processor has. Mm. So you'll one. see sometimes <laughs> on a spec sheet, you'll see something like, you mightn't even see the word processor, you might see something like AMD or Intel or something like that. Is that what we're talking about when we're that, that, that's the, that's the branding of the processor. Now you can always take the brand name and the model number and search online and it'll give you exactly what speed it can go to, what speed it can boost to and like said so how many cores it has and also like a, a brief review of it. Okay. For me, for me, the processors, um, uh, you know, you could compare it to the engine of your car, how, you know, how big and mm. how powerful the liter engine of your car. It's, it's very similar in, in the way it's rated like the, the more the bigger the engine liter size, the, the, the generally more speed you're going to get with that car, more power. So it can, it can be relatable to processors in that way. Um, that's that's kind of the way I look on it. Uh, that you know, if you want that power there for doing for doing uh, the tasks, you know, maybe you're doing video editing, um, stuff like that. Uh, you, you're going to need that power. Because because uh, what what's become pretty like popular is the term RAM in terms of memory. So when you go into a shop, mm. it's all they're always advertising the amount of RAM that's available, and they'll mm. often say you know two two gigabytes four eight sixteen, and so we, we're, people have come accustomed to searching for RAM. But RAM, while very important, you know you also need a good processor. And some shops will sell a laptop with very high RAM and a lovely keyboard and a lovely screen and you know everything else. But then the processor is very mm. slow, and when you get it home, and the time you put all your software on your assistive software, things are running a bit slow because that processor can't keep up. Mm. Yeah, 
OK, so the processor is like one of the really key things, but you mentioned RAM there as well. What what actually is RAM? What's important for? RAM, RAM is memory in the computer. So while the processor is like the brain and it's doing all the computation, RAM is what it's holding in memory and how many things it can do at once. And so the more RAM you have, the more programs you can have open, the more tasks you can be doing at once. It's all enough like for multitasking, but each one of them open each one of them things that are contained in RAM are, are going to be sending information to the processor. So they work a lot in unison. Yeah. And I suppose another good thing is, you know, if you've ever even opened up your web browser and you have five or six or seven different tabs open, um, you know, all that is taking up some of the memory because each page is being stored that you can flick between. And uh, Particularly, you might notice if you if you have a, a phone from a couple of years ago, and you open up your web browser and there's ten tabs open, and it's really slow. The whole phone's grind yeah, spot. Yeah. That's the RAM being pulverized there, so it is, and it's been really used to the, the full of its extent. I, I remember oh, a family okay. member one asking me why their laptop was going so slow, and when I called around and had a look at it. It was because it had forty word documents open at the same time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it just didn't have the RAM to be able to cope with it. <laughs> yeah. OK, so, so that's actually quite useful to know straight away. So the processor is the brains of the laptop. The RAM is kind of the the working memory, if you like. And it's if I suppose if somebody was a multitasker, if they were constantly using a number of different programs together, that's where they'd really need a good level of RAM. Absolutely. If you're if you're like using Zoom text, which is already going to be using a bit of RAM and a bit of the processor, and then you have a large Excel sheet open, or you know, maybe even a Microsoft Access database open, or something that's going to be, mm. you know, it's going to take a lot. You know, it, it's both going to be competing. Or, so you need enough for both programs, if not enough for a lot more programs. Okay. Okay, so that's that's interesting. And just to give us a bit of an idea, what would be a good amount? So let's say somebody is just using a laptop for very basic things. What would be a good amount of RAM? Or if you're going to use the laptop for very intense things, what would be a good amount of RAM to have? Well, if you're if you're just internet browsing and you're just going to be doing things like that, not into taxing, like eight is probably the the least you want to be aiming for now. Um, mm. If you're going to be doing tasks like um, like a lot of work-based tasks, or you're going to be like multitasking a lot, like 16 gigabytes, especially for someone in employment is going to be doing a lot of that thing. And then if, you're, if you have any gamers in the house, they're going to be looking for 64 and 128 and ridiculous amounts for uh, processing their games. But for our, for our purposes, 16 is a, is a nice amount. Okay. Yeah. Very good. OK, so that gives us a bit of an idea. We can kind of make sense of some of those numbers and terms on the on the sheets. Now, it's kind of important to distinguish as well between when we talk about RAM as memory, um, we're not talking about storage. What are the things that we need to look at in terms of storage on a computer? In so storage. File storage? Yeah, file, file storage is um, is kind of the hardest one to, to kind of get right. Um, People love backing up their phones, their photographs, everything onto their PC. God forbid if they lose their phone or it gets damaged. So, mm. um, you, wait, if you get if you're getting a laptop, maybe with you know 32 gig memory or 64 gig uh, memory in it. Now this is not the RAM. This is the storage space. You're going to find mm. that that's going to fill up extremely quick. So mm. you're better off going for 240 gig upwards I, is what I would recommend because uh, you know as you're storing stuff there you, you're typing up files you're saving them uh, people sent you mm. emails you're saving the attachments things like that maybe you're doing a small bit of video recording as well or you're downloading a uh, bit of video you know that that's going to take up the storage space until you unless you're going to delete them or move them across to a portable hard drive but um mm. And there's also two types of, of um, storage systems out there. You have your traditional hard disk drive and a more modern solid state drive, which has really come to prominence over the last, I uh, suppose, two to three years. And mm. these these new solid state drives, they're, they're way quicker. Um, that your whole system runs quicker with them. Uh, even, even um, you know, a laptop that that might not have a great processor or a great amount of RAM and still run mm. a lot quicker if it has one of these solid state drives. So they're, they're quite good to have. And they also, uh, one thing I like about solid state drive is they're less prone to damage if, if, if default. So somebody who's moving around the laptop, 
um, you know, if to just plonk it down on the desk, not, not fears hard, but a traditional yeah. hard drive might like might like to get a little bit damaged from it. Uh, yeah. The new solid state drive won't. Because there's, there's no there's no moving parts in the solid state drives. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. While the old okay. the old the old HDD drives have a, have spinning disks, and if they're in the middle of read write and someone does like Daniel says, give the laptop a good bang, those disks can get locked. Yeah, and then they're more or less a write off. So the solid state drives much much better. Okay, very good. And again, just to kind of get give a bit of a real world sort of um, image to this, what what where would you see the difference in speed when you mentioned the solid state drive being a lot faster than the hard disk drive? Why, where why do you see that speed? Why why I say that um, is Microsoft Windows. Uh, while it's a decent operating system, it's greedy, and no matter how much RAM you have. In your computer, Microsoft Windows ha- has a habit of using a small little portion of the storage space as a virtual RAM. Um, mm. It writes pieces, it writes some of the stuff that should be going to RAM there on the hard drive. It's just a design mm. that Windows has had going back from day one. And, um, you know, when RAM used to be more expensive and storage was cheaper, they just done this thing and still stuck with that habit. So if you have a slow hard drive, the old HDD hard drive, it actually slow, it pull, drag down the performance of the whole system. Yeah, so like, it's where the solid state drive is instant access is much quicker. You really notice yeah. the difference on boot times when you're starting up the computer for the first time and you're nearly at the login screen within two or three seconds while we used to have to wait two minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so so that's a serious um, and, and also when we, if we go to open a program, like the, it has to be written into memory, so it has to read that from the hard drive. Yeah. And if it has to read from a spinning hard drive, it can take a few seconds, you know, up to a minute sometimes, depending on how slow your computer is. Mm-hmm. But if you have a solid state drive, it's nearly pulling that into RAM almost instantly, and therefore it's being used almost instantly. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, and, all, and all these things make a real really difference. Make a difference. Yeah, because that's, to be honest, it, it might sound like, you know, you're waiting a minute for something and, and that's not very long. But to be honest, everything you're doing on a computer, it's made up of multiple tasks. Yes. It might You want them to be a few seconds and it might take a minute or two. That really delays you, doesn't it? It's, 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 like, it's, like, a, it's like a three-man relay there between the processor, the RAM and the hard drive. And if one if one of them isn't up to, up to the task, it's going to let the other two down. Yeah, definitely. And, uh, yeah. Uh, that's yeah. what's happening and a lot of times when people buy laptops is the hard drive size I might go this is a 500 gigabyte hard drive I might say oh this has 16 gigabytes of RAM and that automatically looks like a great deal but then they're not telling you anything about the processor mm. and therefore you okay. buy that one it's got a real slow processor and that's the man and the, and the team that's letting it down and gotcha gotcha and it was mentioned there a minute ago about Windows um, the operating system windows yeah. are there alternatives to that what because that's one of the most that's probably the most popular thing you see uh, these days you might see windows 10 for example in the specifications sheet is that all there is no there's lots more out there there's um with the chrome the chrome books uh, have their own chrome op- yeah. chrome operating system and uh there's linux out there there's more as well. Mac, they're, Mac of course. Mac, yeah. Mac as well. Absolutely forgot mm. about those. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so they, there are the four main operating systems, I suppose, at the moment. There is other uh, smaller operating systems out there as well. Yeah, that, that, definitely Mac and Windows are the biggest uh, two in the market. And you have things like Chromebooks, but a Chromebook, while it looks exactly like a laptop, you can't run the same programs you can as on a laptop. Yeah. Uh, okay. So you can't, you can't go buy Zoom text or JAWS and put them on a Chromebook because it's technically a different operating system entirely than what Windows is using or what your laptop, are, which is using Windows, is using. Mm-hmm. So that'll be really important for people because Chromebook do tend to be quite a bit cheaper, don't they? So if you're looking for a new laptop, you might be seeing the Chromebook and think, well, there's a good option for me. But as you say, some some of the software you won't be able to actually install the same way. No, like yeah, like the um, screen screen reader on that is Vox, and like it's 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 getting better, but it's not as good as JAWS or NVDA or even Narrator. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 
Okay, so that's that's an important one. What about um, one of the other things you sometimes see is something to do with maybe graphics or the the audio quality on it again. And again, you'll get kind of all these sorts of names that come up for what provision there is for graphics or for audio. And you might see a name and a number and it doesn't even seem like English anymore. What, what is important to consider in relation to graphics cards or audio or anything like that? Well, we had a question there about uh, how do you connect your laptop or your computer to a large smart television mm -hmm. or a larger screen and your graphics card would often need a HDMI port to do that. To do that in the easiest yeah. manner, you need a HDMI port on both your TV and your laptop. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's one thing you have to consider about your graphics card on your on your laptop or PC but graphics cards will have their own internal RAM also depending on if you know if you want to play games or not if you don't want to play games you know yeah. so you're not so much concerned about that as, as much as the connections on it but you still want to know what output your graphics can do like can it put out 4k can it put out 1080p how fast is it going to be and what what can it do like if you have um, if you're using magnification software, you might need to sort of make sure that your graphics card will work in conjunction with that because some people with onboard graphic cards, especially in laptops which are built into your processor, sometimes can cause a conflict in that there. We have to go look for drivers or different ways to configure them. Okay. So that's handy to just keep in mind again because. Those are the sort of things that people see on spec sheets, but actually it's probably, you'd probably see HDMI actually written on the spec sheet as well, wouldn't you? Um, oftentimes. So you, you would kind do. of have an idea that, that it can do that. So pe people um, can buy an HDMI. Like, yeah, go on. So some pe people can buy a HDMI cable quite cheap, connect it into mm -hmm. your laptop and connect it into your television. And then you just go to that input source on your television and your mm -hmm. screen can be duplicated then. Mm. Excellent. Very good. And yeah. um, what about if somebody was to go, speaking of screens, if somebody was to see, you know, one of the, one of the laptops that's on display might have a touch screen on it. It's, is that something to go for or not? Is that, would you advise that or not? Well, it, it entirely depends on what you want to do on it. Mm. Someone who's predominantly using the screen reader might never, ever want to have anything you know, touchscreen in terms of a Windows environment, but maybe down the line, like when when the JAWS touchscreen sort of functionality gets better, especially with like laptops now, you can take the screen out in their tablets, much like the, the Windows um, Surface Book. Mm. You can plug it into the keyboard, it's a full laptop, you unplug it and then it's basically a tablet. So I think I don't uh, think the touchscreen ever took off the way they, they, they had hoped, depended. no. And yeah. what I've noticed is like the gestures that you would have probably used on a touch screen, you know, like you would on a tablet is pinch zoom on, on the screen that you can actually do that on the touchpad now. And that'll if you're on Chrome, it'll do a lovely smooth zoom in and out. Just mm. do the pinch the pinch gesture on, on, on most touchpads on modern laptops now. Right. I, I, I do see like maybe five or six years down the line that JAWS's touch screen controls will be better. So people who want to use a Windows environment much like they would use their iPhone will mm. be like it's not great at the minute but down the line that's something that will probably improve yeah very good so that's kind of future proofing it a little bit future proofing the advice a little bit as well which is Andy so <laughs> uh, keep an eye on that one to see how effective that is moving on just to software um because yeah. some laptops when you buy a laptop it might have some software with it some of that is good and some of it mightn't be so good and then we're also going to be talking about just in a moment the uh, accessibility software that we might want to add to it but if we th just think for a moment of what comes with a laptop sometimes um you might have like maybe a Microsoft Office subscription for a year or something like that might be included in it. Is there any software that you kind of need to be a little bit wary of? If you if you buy a laptop and it's got software on it, that's is there any that's like a little bit less useful or can be a bit problematic? Yeah, well, there's often what the, what the term uh, bloatware included with a laptop that you know you, you just basically want the Windows uh, features with the laptop, but the, the, the company who makes the laptop might bundle in some other programs which more or less do the same job as the ones that are already on Windows. Like they might have their own Wi-Fi connector, they might have their own uh, touchpad uh, drivers, they might have their own um, antivirus, might have something on it, but all that's cluttering up your computer and it's more tasks for the 
RAM and processor to deal with. Yeah, the so antivirus awesome. one, the antivirus one you mentioned there, Sean, is is especially important um, because often those there's there's some horrendous antivirus uh, software out there, and it's given to you as a thirty day free trial in the hope that you'll buy it. Um, you know, and I I often just remove that because it's just it really does take back from the performance of of a, of a laptop. Yeah, that's the first thing I do. I, I removed the antivirus they came with. I'd enable Windows Defender, and then I'd remove lots of bloatware that's not needed at all. Mm. Like some sometimes there is drivers unique to that brand of laptop that you should keep, mm-hmm. and others are, are not needed at all, and they can it can really help speed up your computer. So you have to consider when I removed this uh, antivirus they provided to immediately enable Windows Defender, which is the free version that comes with Windows. Yeah. Okay, so it's not dangerous to to uninstall the the free antivirus that it comes with. No, because because there's a, there's actually one in Windows there which is completely free and very very light. Um, while the ones that are provided can sometimes be uh you know a resource drain. Yeah, yeah. Okay. definitely, definitely. Okay, so if we were looking at buying a laptop for a specific purpose, let's say. For example, um, if I wanted to run screen reader software such as JAWS, now that's a, a piece of software that we're actually going to look at a bit more in detail next week. But if I was to be running JAWS, for example, would I need any particular spec of a laptop? Um, well, that, it can be in laptop. It can be down to person's pre- people's preferences because some not laptops don't have a numpad on their keyboard. Mm. And some people uh, who use JAWS use the numpad very much so, and you need it for certain commands, and it's much easier to do with the numpad. Mm. So people have to look hardware-wise, like when they're buying a laptop, if they use a numpad predominantly with JAWS, will that laptop have a numpad? Yeah. Okay. Um, and would there be anything else to consider in in relation to the specs, if you were getting something like JAWS, for example? Well, well JAWS is quite it's quite a good program. Um, mm. It doesn't require a lot of system resources. It still requires a fair bit, but okay. like you, you would want to aim for a processor that's probably at least two point eight gigahertz or higher. Um, you know, eight gigabytes of RAM or higher. Um, mm. and, and an SSD drive, and that's kind of future-proofing yourself a bit that mm. down the line as things update, your laptop isn't going to only last you two or three years, which is often the case because you can buy very, very cheap laptops, mm. uh, you know, 350 euros sometimes, even cheaper, and then two or three years down the line, you're going, geez, that didn't last at all. And then you'll, you'll hear your friends say, well, my Mac, I've had it for eight years and there's no problems with it, but they've mm-hmm. spent up to 2,000 euro on their MacBook. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I think, I think you... an important thing to just to highlight there while you're talking about that, Sean, is Microsoft Windows uh, 10, right? Um, they're, go- they're constantly releasing uh, twice yearly major updates and often they're adding new features and things like that. And what happens is as, as the Windows 10 becomes more and more developed, it's going to become more and more resource heavy. So uh, it takes a little bit more computing power with each update for the whole thing, even just to operate itself, let alone you do anything on it. So as these rollouts continue to come out and come out and come out, your cheaper laptop that you bought last year is going to really struggle with those in, in, you know, in, in just a few short years. Okay, that's good to know as well. So again, if you want a bit of long, longevity, 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 you want to <laughs> kind of get a little bit better. What about if it's uh, if you've got like Zoom Text or Supernova or one of these ones that changes the display on your screen, as well as maybe having screen reader software? Is there any kind of minimum spec or anything that you'd want to look out for, particularly with with those? Well, 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 much similar to that, like the minimum spec, like I would be aiming for, is at least 2.8, 2.9 gigahertz in the processor. Now, if you can go higher, that's mm. great. RAM, like you'd want at least eight, but like with something like that, there you'd hope to have at least 16. That this is all, you know, best case scenario. Yeah. You'd you'd, um, you'd want to have at least 16, and a graphics card, you'd want, you know, a decent enough one. Mm. Um, Probably looking at um, uh, dedicated graphics as opposed to integrated graphics in that regard, Sean, wouldn't you? 
Yeah, definitely. Um, like now, integrated graphics normally works fine. There's just been one or two driver issues with people, and that's very, 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 very few cases. Mm. Maybe just explain that term just to people, because if if we're hearing about integrated or dedicated graphics, yeah. how uh, would they recognise that if they were going out to buy a, a laptop? How would they know it? And that? It used to be a thing that was well advertised in the description, and it seemed to, you know, just looking around at the adverts, it doesn't seem to be highlighted that much. Um, mm. Dedicated is particular of interest, um, you know, to maybe somebody running heavy graphics programs such as CAD or games, things like mm. that, stuff that really does lot, lots of stuff going on quickly on the screen and heavy mm. detail. So a dedicated graphics card for is the graphics has its own little sub processor, its own unique processor running that. Uh, whereas the integrated graphics, they're sharing the workload with your, they're sharing the workload with your main processor, you know, the, the, the 2.8 gigahertz one is taking a bit out of that to drive the graphics. So yeah. where, where you have a dedicated graphics is, it's nearly like a second engine, I suppose, under the bonnet. Okay. That's handy to handy to know as well for, for mm -hmm. somebody. So what we might do actually is just go through a couple of kind of sample offerings that are out there. Now, we're not going to highlight where these ones are from or any particular brands or anything like that, other than maybe the processor types that we're talking about here. Um, but maybe if I, if I read out just some of the specs as they're presented on a spec sheet here, and you can give us kind of your um, opinion on it and maybe almost like a bit of an interpretation about what we're talking about here when when we read this out. So let's say for our first one, we'll pick something under the 400 mark, under the mm. 400 euro mark. Mm. And the spec is this, it says Intel Celeron N4000 dual core 2.6 gigahertz, four gigabytes of RAM, 64 gigabytes HDD, uh, and then it's got graphics, Intel UHD graphics 600, mm. and it's Windows 10, it's a 14 inch laptop. So there's like a spec sheet. What would you pull out of that and say, to be able to tell us what that laptop is actually like? Well, the hard drive is too small, like Daniel said, um, 64 gigabyte hard drive. Mm. The time you do a few Windows updates, install all your software, have a few family photos or videos on it, it's more or less full. Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, it's also the old style hard drive, which is mm. going to be slower. Is that HDD it was or SDD? It, it was HDD. HDD. Yeah. Oh, yeah. well, that's small. <laughs> yeah. uh, and it's four gigabytes of RAM, which is the low end of what you want to be on. But the processor is definitely a decent processor there. So they're leaning the other way where it's a, a decent processor, but very, very low RAM and very, very small hard drive. Mm -hmm. Okay. Definitely. So that's Celeron Dual Core 2.6 uh, is, is not a bad processor. No, that that that's the kind of power, that's the kind of uh, specs of a laptop for someone who's only ever going to be using uh, maybe it to check emails or go on the internet and not ever run assistive software on it or not ever do anything you know. Bar. Also, yeah. the fourteen inch screen is a bit of a small size too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So you're kind of getting what you pay for with this. This is your sub four hundred range. It'll kind of manage, but not do anything spectacular. Cheap and cheerful. Yeah. OK, so for the next one, um, you're talking about somewhere in the region of 600, 650 euros. Um, we're looking at an Intel Core i5 and then it's got a number here, 8265U, 1.6 gigahertz. It says uh, six gigabytes of RAM, 256 gigabytes of solid state drive. SSD, and then it says graphics UHD, graphics 620. Uh, that's a 14 inch screen as well. Okay, onboard so, graphics there, yeah. So what to look out for in that there case there um, is the Intel uh, Core i5, you look at the badge number there, which is A265U, you can do a quick Google search. Mm. So the base speed of that processor is 1.6. Mm. So that's what it's running at at most times to save to save battery to make sure your laptop is going to run, you know, yeah, lot longer because of your battery. But under under heavy duty, if you start running tasks, that can mm. move up to 3.9 gigahertz. Okay, seriously. 
which then you know it's which, which is a good speed yeah but uh, it's it's power it's in a power saving mode where it'll be balanced at 1.6 mm-hmm. but if you start loading in your zoom text or you start loading in you know if, if jaws is doing a massive ocr scan or if you know you've loaded a video it mm-hmm. will then kick in that processor and it'll boost it up to what it needs to be it's your so your turbo mode so you're not running out of battery like it's not in turbo mode the whole time and you're only getting mm. you know five hours out of your battery as opposed to maybe nine and a half mm. okay and would you draw any kind of conclusion from like for example the comparison between we had a celeron processor made from intel before and now this is a core i5 is that important uh to, to me it isn't as important as it what speed it can go to and how many cores the processor would have. Okay. Like Intel is the is the bigger name and like they probably have drivers ready for most things, but uh, like in a buyer's market, you're looking for the best bargain and that's like the, that would be the best chip that has the best speed and, and the number of cores in your price range. Mm. Okay. It's, 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 it's a good chip. Um, they just the way Intel do it is this, the Celeron is kind of the entry level and you have a Pentium which is nearly entry level as well then you go i3 i5 and i7 and as you move up you know as you move up through the i3 i5 i7 you're getting into the absolute premium end of their of their processors so i5 is quite close to the top there so it's up it's up at one of their higher end um the processors mm. okay that's good to know and you mentioned earlier um when I read out the spec sheet there, you, you were saying that it was onboard graphics. How were you able to tell that from, from what I read out? So it said graphics, UHD graphics 620. Yeah, Is generally, yeah, generally they, they would throw in, a, you know, maybe two gig there would uh, indicate that um, it, it has a separate memory for the graphics. So it's, 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 um, it's sharing the graphics with the processor. Okay. Um, like in all that, that that laptop um six gigabytes of ram 256 gigabyte ssd drive which is the faster drive mm-hmm. and the, the process while running slower normally it can boost up so i mean that's for 680 euro 80 euro i think you said that that is quite it's quite reasonable yeah it's yeah. not it's not going to set the world alight in terms of uh you know productivity and all that but it's quite reasonable okay <laughs> So we'll do one more here. So this would be over your thousand euro mark. This is the uh, spec sheet here. So it's AMD Ryzen 5 uh, 3550H 2.1 gigahertz, 8 gigabytes of RAM. And it specifies that this one DDR4 2400 megahertz. And then it says it's a 512 gigabyte SSD and graphics NVIDIA GeForce and it's a 17.3 inch screen. What would you pick out of that as being well, important? Well, th- this one starts off the processor at 2.1, which is, you know, reasonably fast, but it can boost up to 3.7 also. So you're starting off at a, a speed of 2.1, which is, you know, quite, quite reasonable. It's not the highest end, but it can boost up. It has eight gigabytes of RAM and DDR4 is quite, it's got, uh, I think that's two, 2,400 megahertz. So that's quite fast RAM. Mm-hmm. And it's got quite a large um, SSD drive. So, and it's got a dedicated graphics card so and a larger screen. So this is quite a better laptop compared to the other two. Okay. So, when it mentions there those extra details about the RAM, again, just coming from the point of view of maybe somebody who's this is a bit new to, yeah. is is that quite good that that's including the details even? Because I noticed on the cheaper ones, they didn't even include no. any details about the RAM. No, it's the, it's the, it's the newer RAM. Um, if when you really get technical about this, RAM has uh, RAM has its own speeds as well, and it, to most people that's not that's not going to be important. But for gamers, um, you know, gamers and maybe CAD users, 
uh, that would start to get important um, because that you know that kind of activity you can never have enough power. So for most people, uh, it's not very relevant. Okay, so now most of those ones, well, all the ones that we've read a spec sheet for there, they were all Windows laptops. Mm -hmm. Um, you can go up a bit more expensive and get, for example, a, a Mac, a MacBook. Is that um, worth getting an, an Apple MacBook? Is it worth the extra money? Well, the the MacBooks are always very well built. Um, I mean, like they're some of the nicest laptops you'll ever hold in your hand and type on. The mm. benefit of them is they have their own screen reader built into them. They have voiceover built into them. You don't have to go and buy JAWS, um, you know, NVDA is free also, so that's comparable there. But um, it has its own magnification and accessibility features built in, and they're all, they're all quite good. Mm -hmm. But it is a different ecosystem than you might be used to. So some people, it takes a while to get used to it, but then once you do, you, know, you either like it or you don't. Yeah. But Macs are they're always very well built. They're always the nicest looking laptops in, in the in the playground. But mm -hmm. uh they're definitely uh very, very well built. But then equally Windows now are competing with the uh, Surface Pros, the Surface uh, Go and uh the Surface Pro book. Mm -hmm. Uh so they're all equally as expensive and equally well built. Okay. But then you'd still have to go and buy your assistive software on top of that if if you needed it. So largely, you you kind of are talking here about getting what you pay for, pretty much. Yep. Exactly. Kind of hard, hard to disagree with that too. Yeah. It's um yeah, like if you, if you do a small bit of research on it, um you know something comes up in your in your local electrical store and you know it sounds like a great deal and it's a great price point. Just do a small bit of research. Don't rush out and buy straight away. Uh, mm. Do a small bit of research. Um, I often I often be wary as well as the bundles. You know where you're getting fired in the printer. You're getting fired in the the case, the mouse, the office subscription, the antivirus, the whole lot has come together for an incredible price. Something's got to yeah. give there. Something's yeah. got to give. Well, it does, like, uh, if you shop around and, you, and you, know, you sort of know what ballpark you're looking to spend in, you can find great deals. Mm -hmm. There's lots of refurbished machines out there that are very well, um, very well, very well refurbished, and you yeah. can you can get a great deal. But like you said, you, you sort of get what you pay for when it comes to a laptop. And I know many people who spent you know 299 euro on a laptop, mm. and two or three years later they're going, oh, this is very slow and it doesn't do this, and I can't run this thing on it. And uh, it so I was thinking about the after sales, like when when somebody has bought one. Um, sometimes you hear people talking about the kind of after sales service. Is is that very important? Important. Is there any kind of uh, considerations with that that you need to keep into yeah. account? Well, there's, all, sorry, sorry, John, you're gone. well there's, all, there's always your warranty how long that lasts in terms of you know for replacement parts and things like that. But when it comes to when that runs out and like your PC is quite easy to upgrade, you can put in more RAM and you can add in a different hard drive, and that's relatively straightforward on a laptop. That might not be straightforward. Sometimes the RAM is soldered in and it can't be removed. Sometimes the hard drive is an EMMC drive, which are, it's almost as fast as an SSD, but it's soldered onto the board and you can never remove that. Mm. And like that, like they might be 30, 32 or 64 gigabytes. And then once Windows is on it and if you use a few programs, it's more or less full. And I've seen people who can't even do Windows updates because they bought a hard drive, which is an mm -hmm. EMMC hard drive. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as well as from a service point of view, um, like in Ireland, the, the the consumer protection laws mean that you know if you bought it off a store and you come home and you have your years warranty, usually with it is is the benchmark uh, warranty period in Ireland. And you know if there's something wrong with it, it goes back to the store. Now, not not every electrical store, and I could safely say the vast majority of electric stores in Ireland are not going to have a technician on site to mm. fix and repair their laptop. So it usually goes back to a company that the manufacturer has hired to look after their warranty issues. And that can take a little bit of time for, you know, to go on a courier back to probably somewhere in Dublin. It gets put in a queue, gets fixed, yeah, gets sent yeah. back to the shop. You have to go back to the shop to pick it up. So there is a bit of a turnaround time in that. Another another very important thing to know is about batteries. 
and mm. your laptop battery, uh, in most cases, you are only going to get about a six months warranty on the battery. And the simple reason is your battery is a consumable item and batteries have a natural life of about a thousand charge up and discharge. So you charge it up a thousand times and use it. After that, the quality of the cells in the battery naturally start to deteriorate. And you, you may notice if you've had a laptop for a couple of years, uh, oh gosh, the battery only lasts about half an hour and 40 minutes in it. That's because the yeah. cells have, be, uh, have begun their breaking down in it. And the manufacturers kind of said, well, you know, maybe somebody who's using her laptop 18 hours a day, that yeah. battery's going to wear out in six months. So they said, right, after six months, that's it, it's consumable. We're cutting, we're cutting the warranty on that. So that's just another little thing to be, uh, to be aware of. Yeah. Okay, that's handy. That's handy to keep an eye on and it can kind of change how somebody uses their uh, their technology as well. So um, just one last question on this. Um, if we were talking about, we've been talking about kind of buying new laptops and spec sheets and all that sort of stuff. But if somebody was considering buying something secondhand, is there any kind of advice that we could give in relation to buying second hand, is there anything that would be important to look out for or anything to be cautious of? Um, I'm not a huge fan of second hand stuff like that. First of all, you're not getting your your manufacturers or your store your warranty. Um, in the refurbished end of it, you're probably going to get a warranty maybe that's 30 days or three months, 90 days, 30 days or 90 days. Very unusual to see refurbished stuff that you're going to get the full year warranty on. So from that point of view, yeah, you're, you're um, you know, you're probably limited on your cover if something goes wrong uh, mm. soon after. Second of all, I suppose I will bring back into focus that battery thing. Uh, you're buying a used laptop. Um, you know, what's the, if if you need a battery, what's the battery quality like? So mm. they're, they're just kind of two things I would um, be kind of concerned about when it comes to, to um, used pre-loved laptops. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's kind of, uh, it wouldn't be the ideal. No, but if needs must, um, yeah. just be careful. Yeah, there's, there, there is there is lots of sort of good websites that would refurbish, and as long as it's, as it's a trusted website, you'd be in better state than buying it off someone, um, maybe online or buying it through eBay or buying it off, a, you know, out of a newspaper. But de de definitely buying new is always better. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yeah. We, we just have a question in there, uh, Jude. What is the mm. difference between a Mac and an iPad? So the, the main difference there would be like, um, an iPad is quite similar to your your iPhone. It's got it's got a a different operating system. So mm. whether that's you know your iOS or your or your or your, iP or your iPad OS uh, system, mm. it's it's a much reduced version of what would be on, on a Mac. A Mac is a much more complicated um, operating system, much like Windows would be. Mm. So so therefore uh, on a Mac, you know, it's it's a lot more powerful. There's a lot more things you can do. Uh, it's, it's basically a, f a, fu a fully integrated uh, computer as opposed to your your iPad, which is you know. A much more reduced now the ipads have gotten a lot better recently because i know daniel you were mentioning about keyboards and yep. mouse support in in ipads now which is also which is almost turning them into mini laptops yeah i suppose the, the ipad now with the ipad operating system number 13 which is recently launched um you know it's support for a mouse it's it's really going after the small uh, the small uh, laptop market in in the sense you know you can drive a mouse on it and open your apps and be be reasonably productive on them now I have to mm. say yeah, and for some and for someone who uses voiceover like they obviously wouldn't use the mouse support on it but in the iPad OS to be using the you know the the multiple tasks and things like that and task switching and you know that the iPad is, mo is more powerful than most tablets so therefore you can have two or three apps open and you can sort of work and you can move between them as, as a sighted person would using your keystrokes mm -hmm. so it depends on what you feel more comfortable on uh, most people might you know maybe write a few emails on on an ipad or i might even start writing you know if anyone's writing a book i've often seen people in coffee shops with a keyboard and they're writing away on their mac but it mightn't be their main computer 
but Apple are trying to head into that market where the iPad can act as a main computer for someone. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. So they're kind of improving all the time. Very good. So that's kind of given us a fairly comprehensive view, I think, of if if somebody is out looking for a, a laptop and you're wanting to know what's important, hopefully you've got what you need from from this uh, discussion that we've been able to have. So thanks very much to Sean and to Daniel for bringing the expertise there. Appreciate that. (laughs) And uh, if you do have any questions, if anybody has any questions about that and you'd like some support, do please uh, get in touch with labs at ncbi.ie. And uh, speaking of that, we we uh, continue to support people living with sight, sight loss during the current situation and in a number of different ways. Uh, so if you want any advice or support on on any sort of subjects to do with sight loss, please do phone 1850 33 43 53. That's 1850 33 43 53. Or you can email us at info at ncbi.ie. So that's info at ncbi.ie. Well, that about wraps it up for today, but we've plenty lined up for the coming weeks as well. So just a reminder that next week, due to the bank holiday, our show is going to be going out live on Thursday instead of Tuesday. So that's Thursday, the 4th of June, uh, the show will be going out live and we'll be talking about screen readers on that show. So we'll be talking about some of the uh, staples of assistive technology and assistive software um, for a number of years, really, the screen readers. We're going to look at two of them particularly, JAWS, maybe the the best established, and NVDA, a free alternative that, that many people are using as well. Just a reminder that if you want to access support from the NCBI Labs team, you can call us from 9 to 5, Monday to Friday on 1850 92 30 60, or you can email labs at ncbi.ie. And if you'd like to support our services so that we can continue to provide services to those who are blind or vision impaired, you can also visit donate.ncbi.ie. That's donate.ncbi.ie. If you'd like to sponsor one of our live events, you can do that as well by contacting labs at ncbi.ie. And uh, that can just help to, to keep our live events going and cover the subjects that are of particular interest to you. So all that's left for me to do is to thank our uh, contributors, our panellists today, Sean and and Daniel, appreciate that and uh, those working hard behind the scenes to make sure that our show goes ahead uh, nice and smoothly. And we look forward to seeing everyone again next week for the next NCBI Labs live event.